Hello and welcome to this CNBC Africa special. I'm Esther Awuni, thanks for joining us. Today's special will bring you an exclusive on recent developments in Nigeria's banking sector. Now, earlier this week, Diamond Bank announced that it selected Access Bank as a preferred bidder with respect to a potential merger of the two banks, a move they say will create Africa's largest retail bank by customers. Now, I caught up with Uzo Madoze, CEO of Diamond Bank, and Herbert Wigui, CEO of Access Bank, to discuss this in detail. So let's start with the basics. Why is Access Bank merging with Diamond Bank? How about you go first? Very simply, I mean, um, Access Bank over time has built a very strong corporate banking business and commercial banking business, very strong on treasury, very strong on risk management. We've also built and pursued a value chain strategy to deepen our retail incursion. Now, Diamond Bank brings a very strong and phenomenal retail base. Um, they've invested significantly in digital, even though we have done the same thing. Um, but they've been extremely successful as far as reaching out to customers. And they have 17 million customers and a very significant retail base. I think the combination of these two institutions will provide a robust, large, diversified commercial bank with a very extensive retail footprint, which is extremely important in today's, in today's market. Uzama, why is Access Bank a good fit for you? Yeah, well, why can't we do it by ourselves since we're the fastest retail growing bank? Well, I, well, I can say that if you, you know, there's an old saying that says, if you can't beat them, join them. So we're joining, we're joining the tier one rank to become a formidable platform. Now for us, I mean, I think, um, we've, I think we've built a fantastic retail platform, but I think for us to really maximize the resources that we've spent, the resources that we've, um, we've, we've invested, I think we wanted, we wanted access to a bigger platform, a platform that allow, uh, allowed us to really um, um, drive the um, value chain um, across for our customers, one that also gave our customers access to many uh, multiple, uh, multiple touch points as well. And I think one that had a cultural fit as well and, and complementary fit. So I think when we looked at the players in the market, Access Bank was was one. It had a very strong co corporate um, business, um, and and that is very very essential for retail because within every corporate organization, there you see a, re a, re a retail place. So we believe that with the, our, our retail infrastructure and also the technology that we've used, that we can add value to that for the the in, uh, combined cost customer base, but also reach new customers, uh, reach new cost customers as well. And also, I think. Uh, to find inclusion, diversity is one strong point that we're passionate about, and I think that is one thing that also Access Bank has been strong at, and that's why this makes perfect sense for us. Before you looked uh, onto Access Bank, I mean, there was a lot of talk. I mean, it's out there, and uh, I'd like you to just clear that up for us. Uh, is it true that a co investor did offer to recapitalize the bank, inject fresh capital? Is that true, and did, what was the response? No, so uh, we. As an organization, as a board, we looked at different options, um, uh, combinations and capital rates. Go alone or go together and go stronger. And looking at, and I think uh, we saw, first of all, um, the, and what the decision was, if you could find a complementary partner, because raising capital, you can, have all, you, can, you, can, you can be capital rich, but without a platform or access to markets. And so we, um, it was clear that um, if we found if, if, we, if we couldn't found, find somebody that would help us drive our business, then we would, we would, we would continue our retail strategy. But fortunately, we have a, a, a partner that ha is aligned in the same way that we see, we see the, the, the future of, of people and how they want to do business. And that is why um, we are very, very confident about this combination. Uh, Herbert, analysts tell us that this deal looks good. I mean, the bank, the entity that's going to emerge is going to look good on paper, but not necessarily going forward, perhaps in the short to medium term, an efficient bank because of the non-performing loans from Diamond Bank. So tell us about asset quality issues, if that's going to take a hit, if you're going to take a hit. Let me just answer this very, very quickly, Esther. Um, obviously, the non-performing loan issue is an issue, but it's not a very big issue. Okay. Um, because at the time of the legal merge, it will be written down completely. Now, for most institutions that don't have the capital to take it to the next level, that is where you have a problem. So we're writing off all that non-performing loans, and then, of course, we will recover some of it over time. Okay, so 
Will it affect us in the short term? I don't think that is the issue. The issue of the short term and where you would see problems could be what would you do with respect to cost? What would you do with respect to redundant branches, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But fortunately, because of the deep experience we have as far as M&A is concerned, and I can tell you, I don't know there's any other institution in this country that has as much wealth of, you know, as far as combined institutions is concerned, you know, we will right now start to take the necessary steps together with our partners to make sure that those redundant assets, um, where we truly identify them as such, that basically uh, we can close them. Now, and then of course, we will now use our people, all right, to drive our retail business even more, all right, on a leaner platform than what is supposed to be combined and, and, and achieve what we want to do. There are several great areas of complementarities. I mean, think about the POS outreach of both institutions. We have 33,000 point of sales terminals. We have 3,300 ATM machines, by far the strongest in the country. Think of what all that means to customers. Think about the combined customer base of 27 million people. Think about what Diamond has, 17 million customers and growing as far as financial inclusion is concerned. Those things outweigh all of those things people think. I can take it one step further. Together, we share the same affinity as far as supporting vulnerable group groups are concerned. So women, for instance, all right, we and Diamond, all right, we're in that space. Together, we will shut down that aspect of the market. All and most women will find themselves back in access and us supporting them. So the issue about the bad loan book is being resolved and will be resolved technically and properly. Fortunately, we have enough capital to support the larger entity, but the benefits from this enlarged customer base is unparalleled. But you want to raise more capital, right? $200 million. We do have an arrangement already concluded um, with respect to you know, tier two uh, capital, so that has been done. Uh, we will carry out several other corporate actions required to ensure that from a tier one standpoint, we're fine. But the point remains that just as we are, and from our retentions, we have more than enough capital to do the deal. Okay, Uzoma, I'd like you to explain this also in detail, the arrangement, what Diamond Bank shareholders are going to get. So I understand uh, 3 and 13 cover per share, but I'd like you to tell us that in detail. I think, uh, I mean, it's pretty simple. Um, you get a 3 and 13 cover, uh, one naira, uh, one naira in cash, and two naira thirteen kobo in um, value of shares. So, um, so I think the statement is that, um, that we're getting some dividends, but you're also investing in the potential um, opportunity that the combined, um, uh, the combined entity will, will 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 have. So, diamond is still part of the new well, the. All diamond shareholders are still part of the new, um, the new um, entity, yeah, yeah, yeah. and um, I, I think we are looking forward to seeing um, what um, what the future holds for that combined entity. It's definitely, as Herbert has said, very, definitely very very exciting, um, and I think it's exciting for two two classes of stakeholders, um, for our customers because they now have access to more touch points, but they also have access to more products and services that even the combined entity will create or enhance from the. Um, the products that we, we have, and of course for the staff as well. I mean, Access Bank is in, uh, I think, 13 to 15 countries, so it means that people have an opportunity to grow either locally or internationally as well. So those are the things that, you know, we know that will, will increase. And I think one thing we keep talking about, people keep talking about downsizing, we keep talking about a talent pool. So the combined entity is going to have a talent pool of, you know, the most progressive forward thinking <coughs> Um, um, bankers in the country, and that's that's one exciting prospect. That um, so, so no one is going to be laid off. We both have um, performance criteria for our respective businesses, which we, we, we should follow. But I think um, just like people talk about technology creates um, creates redundancies, I think create, technology creates opportunities. We also have, and I think we, we, have, we also have a program of retooling people as well that still want to stay. In the combined entity, so there, are, so there, I think there are more opportunities than downsides that we are look we are, that we are, we, are, we are looking at for people to grow in the organisation. Okay, but you mentioned some of the uh, issues. I mean, going forward, obviously integration issues. But like you said, this is not the first. It's not the first. Well, like I'm not the third. Not your first radio. <laughs> so, but for you, I mean, looking at back to 2012, Intercontinental Bank, yes. for instance, uh, looking at some of the similarities uh, and compared to a diamond yeah, two, bank now, two different. Two different. Okay, so how is it? How is it different yeah. now? Intercontinental was a CBN intervened bank. Okay. All right, so you had the central bank there for two years. Um, anywhere in the world, when you have a regulator intervene, 
all right, what tends to happen is that customers tend to leave gradually. Um, you also find that most of the good people tend to leave because it's, it's a signal of distress, technically. Now, this is different. This is an institution that is ongoing as we speak. This is an institution that is live, that has good people. Um, you have 17 million customers, and I continue to repeat it because it's a very, very large number. All right, It has a huge retail base, so it's fundamentally different. You want to keep those people because those are the people who interact with the customers. So there are two different scenarios. Now, the only issue people raise is what about those bad loans? And they are going to be resolved. So without that, I think there's no basis for comparing Diamond with the Estwell um, Intercontinental. But what we've learned, though, in fairness, uh, from Intercontinental, there are significant customer synergies and a network, which is important. And so, for instance, people think branch closures are just automatic and just a science. You need to see the interconnectivities and relationships between branches, even in a digital environment. So we will have to test all of those things scientifically, but also test them for real and see the synergies that exist, all right, to determine what to do. So there's been a lot of learning points, if you like, because the Connectal itself was a huge um, institution, okay, and all of those learnings will be brought to bear in a different setting because this is an ongoing business, all right, to make sure that we pull all the synergies together. I remember talking to some analysts. You want to add something? No, okay, quickly. Okay. I think, I mean, like, yeah, I mean, like, we've only done one small integration a very long time ago, but I think today, I mean, we, we share a common platform, a common technology platform, and data is, and data is going to be key in a successful integration. And I think one thing that we have in common is that we have the same platform, common platform, so we're going to be taking data-driven decisions that will get us to the right answer as to how we which branch to close, right? which, which, which um, footprint to change, and um, who is best fit there, because it's all data that we have. And we, I think we both use data to take decisions. So it means that you know, we are probably going to get more right answers than wrong answers, which is, what, which is what makes the difference between a fast and right integration than a one that, that becomes very expensive and long. Okay, now I was saying earlier that I was speaking to some analysts and growth for the new entity going forward is still a concern. I mean, obviously this deal makes you the biggest bank uh, in the country, and perhaps in Africa, by customer, by customer base. And they're saying that looking at uh, perhaps in the last one year, Axis Bank earnings, uh, I think I'm just taking my mind back to the, your last nine month earnings, top line growth was not so robust. So they're thinking going forward, this is going to be a big bank going forward. So in terms of the pace at which you're going to, from a profitability point of view, what can we expect? Some of our weaknesses are resolved through this combination. Our cost of funds is managed significantly just through this combination. Okay. Uh, we are aware that there are other cost elements which we need to work on, but that is by far um, one of the areas that, that can affect profitability, if you like. Um, we, the top line growth was never an issue for us. Uh, we, do, we had a cost issue and it came from a cost of funds standpoint. Now, what this has done is that apart from the efforts which we have brought to bear to bring down that cost of funds, which is working, is that it takes it down even further. Now, from a profitability standpoint, and I don't want to start throwing synergies at you, I am more than ever before convinced that shareholders are going to have very strong value for their money. If we're going to raise capital and people are still going to invest, it's a signal, particularly in this market, that are people who have infinite trust and confidence in the emerging enterprise. I think it's important to note that this new institution being created, having the largest customer base in the continent, coming out of Nigeria, serving the vulnerable groups at a very, very high level, supporting financial inclusion in Nigeria, part of a global enterprise, is one that everybody should be proud of. We are using this combination, which is, in my mind, a combination based on values of two strongly admired brands to show that something strong and decent can come out of Nigeria, something truly global that we'll all be proud of. Okay, just one more question for you. How does this impact on your 2018-2022 strategy? It's in line with it, actually. I mean, if you think about it, actually, if, if there's one thing you can look at is that it actually fast-tracks it. Um, all the things that we said we're going to do, uh, fortunately, this combination brings it, brings it further, uh, forward. Now, the only issues are issues of integration, all right? But all the benefits and the growth trajectory we had seen, this only accelerates it. It accelerates the capital plan as well, but as far as we're concerned, we're well online to achieving our five-year corporate strategic plan. 
Okay, now Zoma, I mean, in, it's in the papers that the regulator has said that uh, it has no objection. So mm -hmm. can I ask you if you have regulatory approval right now? We have um, no uh, objections right now. and we'll, I think we should be getting, in principle, regulate, um, approval very shortly.